Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, our guest is actually a return guest. Last time it was him and his wife, but this time it's just him because he wants to share with us a testimony that he has of something that happened to him in October of 1999. He's prayed all throughout his life to see heaven. But one day, as he was praying for heaven, he actually got hell. You're going to want to hear this. And on top of that, there was a time when he was praying for a man to recover who was dying. And God told him, stop praying. Don't do that. You're going to want to hear why. And on top of that, he actually explains how the bottomless pit of hell is bottomless. If that has bothered you or boggled your mind for so long, you're going to want to hear what he has to say is the reason why it is bottomless and what makes it bottomless. Scott Cumbie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Miss Jennifer. So Scott, last time we had you and your beautiful wife, Amanda on, but now it's just yes, you. And the reason is because you actually have a testimony where you went to hell. So I want you to share that with us. One, you said you've been praying since you were eight years old to see heaven. What happened? Well, <clears throat> all my life, I really wanted to see heaven. And um, as a little child, you, you hear about it. You hear about a wonderful place where the father sits at. And my mama told me that she heard the voice of God when she was younger. And I always wanted to hear his audible voice, but I also wanted to see this place called heaven where God sits at. And I would pray many, many nights and I would pray and I would pray. And sometimes we don't realize that today might be the day that our prayer gets answered. And um, we went through a flood and we was reconstructing the house in October of 1999, a few years back. And <clears throat> I was on top of the ladder. And when I was sitting on top of the ladder, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit says, get off the ladder. And I start getting off the ladder and I'm getting ready to go down and start praying. And I could just feel his presence it's so strong. And his presence was like a blanket that could come on you. You could feel it. And I'm like, okay. And I knew what I've been praying for because my prayer was, I want to see heaven. And I heard the voice so clearly. It says, what do you want to see? And when I had it all planned out, heaven, heaven. And something came out of me and said, hell. And when I said that at that moment, I went like into an open vision. My body started descending down and I was on my knees and it was like I went through the floor and you could see like part of the dirt and it went black. It went totally dark. At that moment, I didn't realize what was going on. It's almost like you're on a train track. You're just, you're moving and you can't stop it. And I'm just like, what, what's taking place? And it got cold at first. And that told me later that I had my senses because you can feel the coldness and it's of the earth. And then it started getting, started moving faster and faster. And you started feeling heat. When I ended up stopping, you pass through a set of gates and it is so dark. It, that's why the Bible calls it outer darkness. But there's so much heat inside this place. And I'm sitting back here and, and I am trying to deny what's taking place because I'm fighting this within myself saying, what is taking place here? And I started seeing things. It was so dark that you couldn't see. But in the spirit realm, you can still see. And I don't know if that we understand that 100%. It's almost like God saying, listen. As days went by, he's sort of showing me pieces of this over and over in my mind, showing it to me, replaying it. And it was like a, um, like a crime scene. You, you kept seeing it over and over and over happening. And I started to understand it because sometimes when you're in the presence of Almighty God that you don't realize everything until later, the greatness of what took place. And so when I passed through these gates, there was a lot the size probably like this. And there is a lot on hell. There is a lot there. And then later I found out what scripture says, that he come to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So there is a key there. There has to be a lock. And these bars, they were weathered, but they were sufficient. They were holding in what was inside. I was getting ready to see. And I, it's, it's, 
it's very different because all my life I'm sitting here in church praying, studying, talking about Jesus, leading people to Jesus, and now I'm in hell. This don't make no sense. And I'm like, Lord, I, I don't understand, but I got scared. I was afraid. You don't know how to breathe. You just, you're there. And I've heard different people talk about different things through the past afterwards, but there was this being that is inside of this cage. It looks like when you hit, it stops that fast. And when it stopped, after you pass through the gates, there is something coming out the side of it, on this side of me. And it is chained. And it reaches out, and you see three, three, not five, but three, it looks like fingers. And he reaches out like that. And I am terrified. I am a born-again Christian that is terrified at this moment. Because to be absent. I don't know if I'm, I don't, I don't know what's happening. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what's happening. And I'm just in a fight or flight mode. Then I'm like, and you can't back up because it's in chains, but it's coming at you like this. And I'm like, Lord, help me. And I started going down faster and faster at that moment. And at this time I'm, I'm moving in a different rate. And it's like, what is taking place? And uh, it's almost like the fair rides when you turn upside down and you're falling everywhere. And I, I didn't understand what's taking place, but I know one thing, God saved me from this being that was trying to reach out and you felt him. It's like when he goes through it, you can feel him trying to come at you. And the only thing stopped him was the hand of God. It had to be them chains at that moment. But when I started falling, there was another creature that is chained like in the side of something. I don't know how it works. I don't know what it comes from. I ain't never really watched horror movies at all when I was little. I, I didn't like those things. They tell you, I didn't like it. And so these beings is some of the things that what I seen, it looks like Hollywood today. And there was another one that reaches out. And when he spin by, it felt like it went through my inner stomach. I've dealt with kidney stones in the past and thank God I don't have no more. It felt worse than a kidney stone, the pain that I felt. And it felt like it cut me open. And when I look down, it's so dark that you can't see down, but I'm looking down and I don't feel no blood with my hands falling. There's no blood there. And I realized later that the Bible teaches us that life's in the blood. And so in hell, there's no blood. And I'm falling and I'm falling and I'm falling. And these things are taking place. And at times you can feel the heat that you know is flames in front of you, but it's, it's heat. And at that moment, I'm sitting there saying, Jesus, help me. And I felt like I was totally lost. For, I have never felt that isolated in my life. And what do you do? You call on Jesus. And at that moment, when I come to inside the house, in the floor, curled up, almost like in a fetal position, on my hands like that. I get up and I said, this, 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 this ain't, this ain't, this ain't real. This, this did not happen. And I says, it don't happen. It don't happen. It's almost like a victim. Sometimes when you go through things, you deny that it ever took place. And sometimes you can ask people that's been hurt and they'll say, never happened to me. They just try to block it out their mind because all my life I've dealt with spiritual issues and I've seen things that I didn't like. And um, these beings that I seen, they had scales the size of my hand on them. And the side of his arm looks almost like an alligator, but it looks, it has scales on it. And <clears throat> I'm sitting there, Lord, this ain't real. This this can't be real. This this had to be because I didn't understand visions at the time. I didn't understand because I weren't taught that in a Southern Baptist church. We was taught the Bible. It happened then, but not now. And how can you tell somebody that's experienced something that it's not real? They know what they've seen. And so I'm telling myself, maybe it's a dream. Maybe you just you blacked out. Maybe it's something like a movie. Maybe it's a movie. And um, I don't know, but I, I couldn't figure it out. 
but I've never seen nothing like that before in my life. And so I start going to the bedroom. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get on telephone for a second. I'll get, get. And I walked in there to escape the place where I was at because I didn't like the area where I was because I just wanted to leave it. And so when I went in there and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, says, go to the mirror and look at yourself. And when I looked at the mirror, just like I'm looking at you, there's water blisters on my forehead. It looks like water blisters, white, white blisters with waters inside of them. And it says, what you seen? I said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And he says, take your finger and wipe across it. And when I wiped across it, Miss Jennifer, they were gone. And here's what I heard. What you seen is real. And at that moment, I was terrified. I'm a born-again Christian, and why did I see hell? I've always wanted to see heaven, and I got to see hell instead of heaven. And I start going there, and I start asking God, God, why? Lord, why? Please, come reason together. I want to know. And it would take me a while to read the Word more and study it. And then I found out the location of hell. I found out, as the Bible says, that Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. So must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I understand that the heart of the earth is where the pit is. You can take a peach or anything else. There's a pit in the middle. And so when I was sitting there going through all these things, I'm sitting there saying, God, I, I need more wisdom now to understand, to prove to myself, because I'm a type of person like this. I don't care if I see it. I don't care if it's a vision. I don't care if an angel comes up to me and says, Scott, this. If it goes against God's word that's in front of me right here, I believe it not because heaven and earth will stand the times. His word will. It'll pass everything else. Heaven, earth, who sits on that throne in heaven, Jesus Christ, the Father God, Holy Spirit, they will be here. That word will always be here. So I started studying it and I said, okay, God, okay, can you help me with this information? Can you show it to me? And I said, how can it be a bottomless pit? Why was I falling in the middle of the earth? And um, I never understood that. How could it be a bottomless pit if it was in the middle of the earth? And the Lord started dealing with me. He says, Scott, what is that? It was a concrete truck, cement truck that hauls concrete. And um, he's like, what does it do? And I knew what he meant. But in my nature, used to, I would love to cut up a whole bunch. If you ask me a question, I would always try to cut up. That was my sense of humor. And God, he's, he's still working on me. That's all I got to say at times. And so I was sitting there and I says, it, it, Hauls con it hauls concrete, it mixes it. He said, no, Scott, what does it do? And I stopped, and I knew at that moment, he's telling me something that's more important, very important. And I'm like, okay, than what I was thinking at the time. And I'm looking at it, the concrete truck outside, and I'm sitting there thinking it. He says, Scott, it spins. I said, yes, sir. Because when it was driving down the road, it was turning. It says inside of it, it's like I just went right straight to it, and I could see a rock that was falling. And every time it goes up, it falls, and it falls, and it falls. And at that time, I realized him letting me know. He says, Scott, I hung the earth on nothing, and I put it in motion. And I understand the Bible teaches us that. And I'm like, okay. He says, when you was in the earth, he says, you was spinning because the earth is always moving. So if you're falling inside the pit, and when you do the diameters of it, it's really interesting how God has made this place because he gave man earth. Think about this. Man didn't inherit heaven. God gave man earth. And that's our inheritance. So guess where hell's at? In earth. Then you go a little bit further. One day, hell will be thrown into the lake of fire because there's a new heaven and a new earth. So God takes care of everything. This is what caused here. We'll fix this problem. And uh, the king's anger ain't but for a moment, but when he's fierce, he turns everything upside down. And so then I started realizing, okay, hell's in the heart of the earth, and it turns. But Lord, how can it be inside of Luke chapter 16 that the rich man was talking to Lazarus, he's talking to Father Abraham, asking Lazarus for some water. How, how can this be? What happened? And then I later I started understanding. Do you remember when Christ was on the cross and he was being um, he was giving his life for us? There was two male factors. One, he said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." 
So when he said he'll be with him in paradise, and the other one rejected him. Because he says, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. He looks at him and says, today. Well, when Christ was sitting there giving his life on the cross, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three, let the truth be established. So you've got two male factors that is witnessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, give his life. He tells one that he's going to be with him that day in paradise. But the Bible says he's going to be in the heart of the earth. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Son of man must be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so I'm sitting there studying this and I'm starting understanding that when Christ took his, when they took his body off, they would have took his body and brought it to Gehenna, a place of capitulous fire burning. But there was a man named Joseph of Arimathea that went requested the body to have it put in a tomb that he would have scars, a body with scars, because his body would have been burned up without scars. Well, that's wonderful with the body, but what happened to his spiritual man? What happened to this Pat when he died? The Bible says he went into the heart of the earth and preached to the spirits for those days. So can you imagine Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went in it and got the keys of death, hell, and the grave? And this is what's really amazing. Now, you know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, we had men sitting there. And they're telling the people in paradise, this is the Son of God. He's coming. He's coming. Now you got the two witnesses a few minutes later when they die. As they was executed, imagine one inside paradise and saying, that's the son of God. I seen him on the cross when he was sitting there bleeding. Then you got the other one that's in hell saying, that's the son of God. I just seen him on the cross. And then Christ walks into hell, defeating it by his wonderful, pure, holy life. And he takes those keys back. And now Christ has got a place that's called everlasting. So now Christ takes these keys back on the third glorious day. We know what happens. It's a resurrection time. And then he takes the saints that's with him in paradise and pulls them back out. He presents the blood to Christ on the holy temple of altar. And now we go up instead of going to paradise because paradise was a great gulf in between hell. There was a great gulf in Luke chapter 16 that says it separated them. Father Abraham was over here with paradise and the rich man, a certain rich man, that tells me that this was not just a little parable, that this was a true story because here's what he said. He called out Lazarus' name that was there and he also called Moses. So he's talking about people that they knew about during this time so that this great gulf is now empty. Why did it have to empty? Because of this. The Bible says hell has to enlarge itself. So if hell has to enlarge itself, it's got to take up more territory. Guess what territory it took up? It took up paradise. So now we step into a place that the earth is sitting here. And we think that there's things not going on. I'm here to tell you today. I'm sitting inside of a studio and I'm looking here, but below my feet, there's people that's burning from the very beginning of time. There is people that's in chains of Satan. There is demons that's sitting there, fallen angels that has done things that was against the word of God and that they are inside of change right now. Here is the reason why Satan right now is not inside of hell burning because his time has not been judged. He has not been judged yet. So we got to understand that hell is a place that is torturing. When I realized this and later as I kept going on and on, God started showing me more and more of this, this, this whole entire situation. Scott, look at this. And I said, God, why did they hate me? He said, because you was made in my image. They hate anything that's made in God's image. They cannot stand it. Inside of Isaiah Proverbs, you can look in um, Job and Jonah. The Bible talks about there is a holding cell. And when we sit there, we can see that when I fell through those gates and went into that pit, when I fell inside of that and landed inside of that cell and that being come out with those three fingers, I was terrified and he was going after me, and those chains stopped him when he swung by. But the one that was chained like on the side of the wall, and it's completely dark, when it cut me, it felt like it opened up everything inside of my being. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, my daddy's a type of man that he don't run away from the fight. He'll run to the fight. He didn't mind a good confrontation. He was ready for it. That was, I don't know if it was because out of fear, he just still went after it, but that's the way my daddy was. And I started sharing with them what I seen. 
And my daddy ran away from that. They said, oh, I don't want, I don't want to hear this. Just be quiet. So just be quiet. Do you hear me? Just be quiet. And so I'm sitting over there trying to tell my family what I just went through. And I'm watching my daddy that I consider fearless, very fearful. And uh, I started trying to think about this more and more and more. And so here's where it happens. Many years later, I'm sitting there inside of the truck was going to a place called um, <clears throat> Ward's Grill to get a hamburger, me and my, my friend. And he's watched a program on uh, a network. And he's like, Scott, I've seen this network. And he says, um, I heard about this man that went to hell. And I just turn and I'm sitting there thinking, all right. He says, and this, he said, you never believe what it has. I says, what does it have? He says, guess what he ended up, where he ended up? At? I said, probably in a, a cell. He said, he did. Did you listen to it? He said, did you hear about the fish scales? I said, they ain't fish scales. I said, they're the size of our hands. I said, they're like alligators, big, big scales. He says, you did listen to it. I said, no. He said, how do you know this? I said, did he say this, this, and this? And he just looks at me. He says, Scott, what do you know? I said, I ain't never told you this part about me. I said, because I've tried to hide this. I don't, want, I don't want this. And I started sharing with him. He says, Scott, he says, do you know what you saw? I said, yes, I do. I, he says, why won't you share it with people? I said, because I can't figure out these water blisters on my head. I said, it don't line up in scripture. And I says, I can't share this with people unless I know it come from scripture. And he's like, Scott, the world needs to hear about this. And he started telling me about some more people. He says, Scott, it lines up. I says, I know it does, but I'm not ready yet. I, I can't do this. And then later, I find out watching a little movie on Moses. And Moses just takes his hand, he sticks it inside of his shirt, and it becomes leprosy. And when I seen that, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This was many years later. He says, look up leprosy. And so I take my smartphone out. I pull up leprosy and I look at it. I said, okay, I see it. He said, look at the side effects. Look at the symptoms. Look at the blisters. And when he said that, I'm like, oh my goodness. Tears starts coming up in the corner of my eyes. And I'm like, okay, okay. Because I'm ready to share this with people even before this, because God's laid on my heart so much, share, share, share. But I'm telling myself, Scott, I'm fighting it every, way, every, every, every part of my being. I'm fighting it. How can I do this? And when I read some of the side effects of is water blisters with whiteness inside of it. And when I seen one of the pictures, I said, that's what I saw. He says, Scott, what you've always been looking for, it was in the word the whole entire time. All right. So, Scott, I actually want to go all the way back to the beginning uh, when yes, you said that you saw hell and you saw the chains, when you fell through, did the chains open or, and did that lock open for you? Because how did you get through or did you not get through? Miss Jennifer, when I passed through it, it looks just like my fingers. You went through it just like this. You fell in it. And when I went through it, what caught my attention was how massive this lock was. It looked, it was more than ribbits. I have never seen work like that because when I was little, I used to try to break in little locks, open them up. I just like to cut up with locks. And when I went through this thing, I didn't realize sometimes what God gives us a desire to study is something that one day we're going to face. And um, so when I went through these bars, it's just like you went, you passed through them. The best way I can describe it is this. God sets in motion the ocean. He says the ocean can only go this far. But yet, you can pour water from a river that goes back into the ocean, but the ocean will never come back. So the seal that is set there on this, because this is interest, the part that I wanted to share with you a little bit later, inside of that, there was something on that lock. And there is a seal that is made inside of that lock. It looks like a seal. And that seal, it comes from the king of king and the glory. It comes from God because when he locked it, he gave it for a specific purpose. You can't go out of it. But once you go into it, the Bible says after death 
comes judgment. Doesn't come a second, third chance. So if you go in a religion that teaches you that after you die, you can pray people out of hell, you've been deceived. And it's going to be too late for your family. That's just that simple. And so just like the ocean has a limit on it, you can go into it as an intruder. But once you start falling in, once you fell into it, there ain't no escape. And I thank God that I was not dead because he was allowing me to see this through a vision that I had some evidence later too. But I'm just saying, I would hate to know all my life that I was going to a place that you're being tortured, that sleep flees from you. The Bible says God gives his people rest, sleep. So guess what happens? There's no sleep in hell. There is no peace in hell. God gives us peace. So the absent from God is hell. And think about this. <clears throat> Why would we want to be in heaven with God if our whole entire life we've hated him? We've denied him. Why do we want to show up at the last minute and, and say, Lord, I want to be here now? He says, choose this day who you're going to serve. If you're going to serve God here on earth, you serve him. And we know the blessings is hell for the ones that is sitting there that's being burnt. Is that a blessing? No, that's no blessing. What is that? That's eternal damnation. The blessing for the saint is heaven. So when people sit there and they say, I'm going to have a party. I didn't see nobody, Miss Jennifer. I won't lie to you. When I looked around, you could hear things and you could, you knew things was there, but I could not see individual people until later he showed it back to me. It was so dark till this microphone is darker. It was darker than the microphone and you just, you failed it. And have you ever been into a room that is so dark until you could feel the darkness? It is uneasy. And so for this gate that you pass through, once you're in it, it's been sealed. You sealed it. And when people says, I can go to hell and I can have a party with my friends and it's going to be wonderful, that's a lie from Satan. Remember this. If there's people listening today that you've got your most popular pop artists, people, fans, and you're sitting there thinking, man, I got everything. You have no fans in hell. You are unknown in hell. You are someone that demons hate because when they see you, they see the image of God and they know who put them there. The one that sits on the throne because of their judgment. When they got judged, it's because they walked away from God. And when we walk away from God as individuals, we'll be judged also. You actually said something really interesting, how you mentioned how in hell there is no peace, how there is no rest. But that's what God gives us. God gives us rest and peace. So you'll hear people who may be bitter with life and they'll say, this is hell on earth or we're in hell right now. Could you explain to those watching why this is actually not hell? Our vocabulary is so small, it seems like. And sometimes we like to use the word, I'm, I'm going through hell, or this is a hellacious day. And you hear all these wonderful little acronyms, how they use it. But the how you hide the, the forest, you hide it with the trees. And the enemy tells you, man, this is hell, this is hell, this is hell. You can escape it. You can escape it. You can stop it. The only thing that you can do when an individual takes his life on this earth when he takes, he's going to be judged, first of all, for taking, dying soon. He took his life. God is the giver of the life, life and death in our tongue. And you're going to be judged because this life is but just a moment. The Bible says it's a vapor. But as soon as this life's over, we step in everlasting. And hell is everlasting. The only time that you will ever get out of hell is to stand before God on the great white throne judgment. And I've said this before, and I pray nobody takes this out of term, but I will share this with you. All religions will lead you to God, but they'll lead you to the great white throne judgment. That's where all religions will lead you to. Oh, Scott. Oh, my gosh. Okay, say that one more time. That is really interesting. And I'm glad you mentioned for people not to take it the wrong way. But could you say that one more time? All religions will lead you to the throne room of God. They will lead you to God, but they will lead you to God deceived. When they lead you there, you'll be at the great white throne judgment. And you will hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. 
and you're going to bow before him and confess him as Lord and as the Savior of this earth, but you are also going to be cast into the outer darkness. You'll be cast into the lake of fire that day because the Bible says hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. That's the difference. When people understand that their religion will take them to God, that the only way that you get to stay with God is at the doorway, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, the Bible says. The only way for us to have remission of our sin is for the shedding blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, the blood of Jesus didn't come from the woman. It didn't come from Mary because the blood comes from the Father. So when she conceived and she says, how can it be unto me? She was a virgin, but she was willing to accept it, just like we got to accept the true gift of Jesus Christ today. And when she accepted that, the blood was already there because the Father gave the blood. And the Father identified that this was my son. Now, you see on his mother's side, he was 33 and a half years old, but on his father's side, he was from everlasting. And so you have to understand one thing. Imagine when death had to say, I thought I had him. I thought I had him. But on the third glorious day, every other religion never has their Savior to resurrect from the dead. Ours is the only one. He's made the way. He is the way. He is the life. And so when I serve a God that knows that after when I die, I can be resurrected one day because of Christ lives, I can live also. And so there's a lot of people using the word hell. This is hell. This is hell. I'm here to tell you that hell is real. And what you're going through, it might feel like at times you can feel the pain. And sometimes you do feel hell's glinches grab a hold of you, the very hands of it. But it's the enemy lying to you, telling you that you can escape this right now if you end it. Don't end your life today. Look to Jesus. Give your life to Christ. Die to yourself. Don't kill yourself, but die to yourself. That's what we need to do. And sometimes crucifying our flesh, it means we ain't got to go crawl on a cross, but we can't do what we want to do. We got to put this old man, set him aside and say, God, I'm going to serve you today. And so when we do that, we ain't got to walk. We, we're going to walk through. The Bible says when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're going to have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But remember one thing, a shadow of a sword never cuts you. That is what we need to know, that we're going to see the, the shadow. But thank God that he took the sting out of death. Ever wanted the experience of attending a genuine royal ball? Well, here's your chance. Join Deep Believer Ministries for one of the grandest, most powerful events ever to solely honor King Jesus with a night with the King at the Broadmoor. Enjoy the magnificent grounds, accommodations, and fine dining of the five-star, five-diamond, exquisite Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A Night with the King at the Broadmoor is a very royal, very formal three days, two nights conference that will provide you with hands-on training for true, Christian, supernatural living by renowned teachers and evangelists. This includes training in multiple areas of healing, deliverance, spiritual warfare, how to walk out the abundant Christian life, as well as how to obtain success in finances God's way. Then, for the royal evening, soak in the ambiance of white tablecloth gourmet dining, live brass and stringed instruments, acclaimed Christian singers and worshipers. And what's a royal ball without ballroom dancing? Don't know how? Complimentary ballroom dance lessons are included. A night with a king at the Broadmoor will be a night of complete honor and reverence to our King Jesus and will be like nothing you've possibly ever experienced. We hope to see you there for this stately, eventful night. There was a little boy one time, and he was terrified. I remember my children was, our last name is Cumby, and there was a little bumblebee flying around. And the little boy was sitting there. He was terrified. He said, Daddy, Daddy, I don't like them things. And his daddy reaches there and grabs a hold of the bee. And he turns around and shows the son. He says, come here, son. I want to show you something. He said, no, Daddy, I'm scared of the bee. I'm scared of it. Now, people today might be scared of dying. He says, but I want to show you, son. He said, look at the bee. He showed him the bee, and his son walked up. He says, son, he can't hurt you. He said, Daddy, why can't he hurt me now? He showed him his hand. And in the palm of his hand was the stinger. He said, son, I took that sting for you that you wouldn't have to be scared of that bee. 
And the little boy started breaking down and crying because he knew how much his father loved him. And just like that son is scared today, we might be scared what we're going through. We might be sitting there seeing foreclosures. We might be sitting there seeing the bank sitting there saying, I'm going to take everything you got. We might be sitting there seeing that these, these reports that the doctor has given to us. And we're saying, I don't know what to do. Remember, trust God. Trust God. Because he took the sting out of death. You ain't got to be scared of death. Because when death comes, it's just stepping out of one side and stepping into eternity with Christ. Because he's already taken away the sting of death, hell, and the grave. And that's why we don't need to be deceived by the cares of this world, by the things that's looking around it. There's a lot of people out there that gets their eyes on some material things. I'm telling you, it ain't worth it. Because you're going to pay for it one day with your body. Because if you don't accept the sacrifice God gave us, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. Sometimes in our life, if we do something, we got to pay for the price. And sometimes even when we was little, our tail was what paid for it. And they would beat our tail and you'd have to, okay. But for us to acknowledge, this is the cost of what I've done. I'm here to tell you, when you leave, when you leave this earth, there ain't no coming back and saying, I fixed it. I got it right now. The rich man, when he opened his eyes, the Bible says in hell he was, Luke chapter 16. He was being tormented that he was so thirsty. He seen this man across over there, and he says, I want some water. Now think about this. Lazarus was sitting there. And um, this week we was talking about it inside of the class with the children. Lazarus was brought there. Lazarus couldn't walk. And uh, we've been taking some classes with justice, and I started seeing the perspective of different sides of things. And I'm sitting there thinking, what if I was this rich man? This rich man, he's got it all. But you walk outside and you look out there and you see that them people drop that man off again at my doorsteps out there. Them dogs is around here, they're barking. I'm tired of hearing dogs bark. And we know the rich man didn't give him nothing because the rich man had servants. He just wanted some crumbs from the master's table. And I started thinking about how easy it is when God blesses us to forget about the people that's around us. And here's what I ask myself, God, God, what did he do was so wrong that what we don't do today or what we do? He says, when you know to do right and you don't, sin. That rich man could have been a good Samaritan. He could have said, you know what? I don't want you here, but I can go pay for your place. I can take care of you. What do I mean? The Bible says, when you've done it to the least, you've done it even to me. When you see people out there hungry, feed them. When you see people out there that's lost, tell them about Jesus. When you see people out there cold, don't go pray for them. Give them a coat, then pray for them. If they're hungry, put something in their stomach. And here's what I've said, but Lord, I can only do so much. He said, that's all I ask you to do what you can. Let me put my blessing on it. This message, honest and truthful, it's just a message to some people. You see, I can't save you, but I know a man who can save you. I know the Holy Spirit, how he works, and he'll draw you to him. That's what it's all about. If anybody doesn't know, Scott used to be a preacher. So if you listen to him, he <laughs> he's pretty good at what he's saying. He's very educated. And not only is he educated in the word, he knows the author of the one who created the word, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I have a question for you because I know people are wondering now, okay, hell sounds really bad. Why, for those who don't know, why did God create hell and why are people sent to hell or why do they go to hell? Hell was created. If you remember in the very beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The earth was out form and void was upon the face of the deep. The spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. But in the middle of it, it was void. God made a void spot in the earth. And that place was created when Satan fell. You got ages past, ages presence, and ages to come. In ages past, there was a being named Lucifer. Lucifer had two jobs. He was anointed and he was a cherub. He carried the anointing and he would actually transfer the word from God to earth. And there was beings, the Bible says, you can look inside scripture. There was a place 
And so that there was inhabitants on this earth. When Lucifer fell, the Bible says, um, how do you kill a king? How, how do you take a kingdom? You kill a king. When iniquity was found in his heart, here's what happened. He would stand before God and he had nine stones on his chest. I've seen those stones. I've seen him inside of my house when I was young. Those stones would reflect the glory of God. He was called the light bearer. He would walk into a place and people would see him. No different than when Moses, he came off the, the rock, the hill, Mount Sinai. The Bible says he put a cloth over his face where the people wouldn't see the glory left him because people want you to know that they've been in God's presence. But sometimes we take that presence after we've been there for so long, including ministers, because the Bible says, Lord, Lord, haven't we done these things in your name? Haven't we cast out devils? Haven't we laid hands on you? Haven't we done these things for you? And he'll say, depart from me, because he will not share his glory. Lucifer was the one that done this. And he was like, look at me. He convinced a third of the angels. Think about that. A third of the angels. We, we when the anointing comes on us, we become superpower. Imagine this angelic being that had the anointing carrying on him. And now he tells a third of the angels, listen, I know everything that God knows. And it was a lie. But he convinced a third of those angels. Now, what he didn't understand that God taught him everything that he knew. But God didn't teach him everything that he knew. God knew. God had so much more wisdom. And so Satan come up, the Bible says, Ezekiel, into the mountains. He looked down, but he didn't realize, the Bible says, as light and falleth. He fell straight to this earth. The earth was completely then. It become a time of even as what they've studied, even ice ages, different times that you can go into it, different structures. But it become dark. This is where it gets interesting then. There was angels inside Genesis chapter 6. There was some that was judged during that time. And even inside Genesis chapter 6, that's inside of chains today. And they've been judged. Hell was not created for man. Man was not even born at this time, was not even created. But there was a place of judgment because here's what he said, judgment's coming. Remember we talked about how the snake, how it would bruise the heel, bruise the head. When he told him inside the garden, he even told Adam inside the garden, he says, subdue. Why did he tell him to subdue? He said, there's a snake out there. There's a Satan. There's a devil out there. You see, when you really get interested about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says God planted a tree, planted all the trees there. But I've always questioned, why in the world would God put a tree of knowledge of good and evil? How can, why would God do that? And as I started reading into Matthew and doing a lot of study through different scholars and different things, the Bible says, as the good man planted, there came one that sowed tears that night. You see, I'm persuaded to believe that God, <clears throat> everything he does is good and very good. There's nothing corrupt in it. But there was one that came that night that planted that tree of knowledge, of good and evil. His name was Satan. And he knew the only way that he could get man to fall is for man to look over there. And God said, listen, Adam, don't mess with that tree. You see, because Satan was on this earth, because when he got cast out of heaven, he was on this earth, but he had no authority. He had power, but no authority. He gave Adam the dominion, and Adam listened to the woman, and they both fell. At that time, Satan took it, and guess what Satan said? I can rule this place like I want to. When Christ was sitting there being tempted, Satan even said, I'll give you everything. I own the kingdoms. But when Christ died, he took the keys back. So when people die today and they reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you're going to have the same judgment that Lucifer had. God created you just like he created the angels to enjoy his presence, to enjoy his beauty, to enjoy his creation. But any time that we want to do it a different way, I can sit there and think sometimes how little children, they'll take a round circle and try to take a square block and beat it through it and it don't work. It just don't work. If everything that you're trying in your life hasn't worked at this time, try Jesus. Give him an opportunity. Because hell was created for Satan after man was created in the image of God to rule and to reign, to live in the wonderful glory. What happened? Now when man dies, thank God that we can die of this flesh and we can live again in spirit because this flesh must die. 
But what's so good is to know that we can live forever as we're born again in Christ. And it's truly a beauty. It's a beautiful message to know that God allowed even death of the seed that we could live with him continually. Sin couldn't stop it. Because here's what I'm telling you. Your sin doesn't scare God. Your sin doesn't scare him. The only thing that can reject him is you. Because he will love you even into death. But he loves you so much to give you a free choice. I've always heard this said. If you take something like a bird and you put him in a cage, you don't know if it's yours or not. But when you open the door up and if it flies away, it was never yours. But if it stays, that bird wants to be there. And that goes with our life. God opens up the doors and says, I give you everything. I give you my word. What did the rich man say? He says, go tell my brothers. Go tell my five brothers. Abraham says, you've got the prophets. And if they don't believe the prophets, they don't believe Moses, they won't believe one that's risen from the dead. I'm here to tell you the one that risen that was raised from the dead was Jesus Christ. And if we don't believe his message, I promise you, sitting before you right now as you're watching this, when you open up your eyes and you will after death, you will see exactly what I told you is true. So Scott, I want to go back a little bit to when you were in hell and when you saw a being in a cage. What do you believe this being was? The Bible talks in Revelation that there is creatures. And just as much as there's holy creatures, there's creatures that has fallen also. It was an angelic being. It looked very, very different. It looked almost hunchbacked over when it came out. Its face, I don't like hyenas. Hyenas, when I see a hyena, the way its face is cut up, I've seen that face before. And I'm like, these are like, it's amazing how the enemy always tries to recreate what God does. And um, if you do believe the earth is older than 6,000 years old, and some people does and some people don't, that's a personal opinion. And you believe that there was a race before Adam, before the fall and ages past, Satan tried to make his own race. And that he created things that was abnormal and it was judged because everything God made was good and very good. But Satan makes things that destroys things. And I wonder, is that some of these things that were judged? And um, you could really go in that so many more deeper and just analyze it and look at it. And you could justify it. And some people's like, I don't believe that. And that's their personal opinion. But these beings are real. And they don't look nothing like anything I have seen. But I will say this, if you've studied, if you've looked at Hollywood or seen any previews of movies or different things, that they tap into the dark side. They've seen things. And they're actually getting people so familiar with them until they're actually sleeping with the enemy now. And when you take a covenant with the enemy, you give him right to your place. He comes right in it. And when you open up those doors through television, through radio, through your telephone, and your eyes is a gate and it comes inside of you, guess what you got? You've just been introduced to something that will change your life for a long time because you got to get rid of that demon. you got to get rid of those things because it's almost like a billboard. If you advertise, you get customers. When the enemy advertises what's going on, people say, I like that. I like that information. They don't realize that uh, the enemy's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's not your friend. He will use you, and then he will remove you. He will totally destroy everything about you. And there's people that we've known that has been inside of um, the entertainment business, and what they do is they blackmail them. They take them to a point, and then they use everything that they thought that they was their friends. And that's what the enemy does. He just uses you. Think about this. God never said that serve Satan or serve me. He said man or me. Bible says money answers all things on this earth. You got a problem, you got money, you can fix it. You got a, something wrong with your car, money can fix it. Take care of this, but here's the problem. Money cannot save you. If you will become a ruler over your money and make your money become a slave to you instead of you become a slave to it, 
is a lot of times people, they get up every day to work, to work, to work. I got to do this. I got to do this for me. I got to do this. They won't even go to church. They won't even serve God. But now if you'd pay them, they'd do it. But here's the thing. Money takes them a slave. It's a master to them. So don't be a master to anything. Don't allow it to master. Fall down at the master's feet. Allow him to come into your life. And let's subdue this place. Let's have dominion because God gave it to you. If God gave it to you, you in control. So why do you think people feel so comfortable with money? It seems as if the wealth becomes their God and they're very comfortable. Why do you believe that they look to money the way they do? Money answers everything they need, just like a person that doesn't have it sometimes, like a believer. We believe even that there's money in our bank, but it's not our money. We believe it's God's money. So right now inside my bank account, I'm not limited what the number says. I'm limited of the King of King of the Lord of glory. It's everything's his. But when I look at my money, here's what I say, God is yours. You tell me what. I manage it, and I also ask him for the wisdom. Now, for the world side, their money is what makes things happen. You see, I believe that God has given us just because there's money in the bank doesn't mean I need everything that I want. And it takes discipline. It takes, God, what do you want me to do? The Bible says inside of the life situation that he wants us to be patient he wants us to understand that, you know what? I'm content in this situation. I can fix it at any time if I need to, but I'm content. And for the rich people of this world, there's nothing wrong. Hey, Abraham's rich. There's a lot of wonderful rich people, Solomon, wisdom. But here's the thing, though. Sometimes if we don't live a disciplined lifestyle, we're going to be out of control. If we're not in control, we're out of control. And when you're out of control, everybody around you can tell it. What happens is money is an amplifier. If you get money to an alcoholic, he's going to drink more than he ever has. You give money to <clears throat> somebody that's living a life that's outside the world, you just want to see it to another level, another stage. But you give it to somebody that is willing to discipline themselves and say, you know what? I'm going to take this money. I'm going to make it start working for me. I'll buy businesses. I'm going to set up a trust. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help people. I'm going to make it do it. And at the end of the day, we're going to be judged for how we handled God's resources. For the world, money can get them what they need, but it can only get you what you need in this earth. Then there comes a time that what happens when your money can't do it? That's when you have a problem. How are you going to help your children when they're sitting there sick <clears throat> or they got a demon inside of them? Well, I'll pay a soothsayer. They'll just transfer devils from one point to the next point. What you're going to need is a man or a woman of God that knows the Holy Spirit that when they speak the word, that they've spent more time with God than they have the devil. We live in a society today that people would rather take hours interviewing a devil than spending hours in the presence of Almighty God. There's a problem there. What's wrong with the church is that we've learned how to entertain devils more than we have entertained the spirit of an Almighty God. How can I host him? How can I worship him? Find out what he likes. What do you mean? What does he like? The Bible says it come into his presence with singing. Learn how to sing. Well, I can't sing good. You can take some money and buy a CD then. Put something on. Go inside your house. Anything that's cursed to that place, get rid of it. That's what money done. Money brought curses inside your house. Is money that good? No, but money can be used for good or evil. Money can buy the CD to bring the presence of God in. So when you look at it, it's a stewardship. God said everything that he made was good and very good. But how we manage it, no different today. He give us food, but if we eat too much up, we become gluttony. It's very easy to talk about the alcoholic, but we can't talk about the one that swells up. What we're doing today, we're living in a society that there is a lot of fat people. When I say fat, I mean, guess what, of this world. They put enough money inside of them. They said, I got it. I got it. And I couldn't understand one time when God was telling me about this. And then I realized, Scott, I'm not fasting like I need to. I'm putting more cares of this world. I'm not talking about a size of a person. I'm talking about the size of, guess what, what we allow in our life. We need to live a disciplined lifestyle because the size of the person, we can fix those things. But the size of that man's heart, when there's bitterness there, it's time that we get forgiveness. It's time that we repent. That's what it comes down to, repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. That's All good. Right? And I want to go a little bit more into what you were saying earlier with this being, because you explained 
you know, the money aspect of the heart and all of that. But I want to talk about, uh, say, the senses that you say you felt when you were in hell. Thank God for salvation. But did you, I know you said you heard things. What did you hear? And this being, did he have an odor and did hell have an odor? I am going to be honest with you. When you are so terrified and you are scared, that's what I was. I was afraid 100%. I was taken out of an environment that was peaceful. Because when I left out, we had music going on, worship, everything was doing good. You know what I'm saying? And the CD just stopped. When the CD stopped, it was time to step down. And oh, my goodness. But yes, my senses were still there. Even inside scripture, he wanted water. Why did he want water? He was thirsty. Was this being, could you see him? It was so dark, but I don't even understand how you can see something in outer darkness. But it was almost like days afterwards, Lord kept playing it back in my mind. It's like a movie coming together. I'm like, oh my goodness. And because he knew I was still trying to deny it. I was I reminded myself of Moses. Moses was sitting there saying, listen, I know you told me I, I need to go do this. But I want to give you every reason why I don't need to do it, because my reasons sound pretty good. And um, it all comes down to a point. Give me all your excuses, then go do it. But these you got your senses. I could feel heat. I could feel when I left down, I could feel it cool. And then I started feeling heat. I knew that there was so much heat breathing, Miss Jennifer. I don't know what I was doing, honest and truthful about the breathing, because it was it's almost like everything's gone. And if you study it, though, God's the one that gives us the breath of life. And if there ain't no breath of life there, you're struggling for everything that you're fighting for. And But these beings, they were, you could tell when they came out, this thing's face, it looked almost like a hyena's face that is stretched out. But he had three, those three things that come out. Those fingers looked about, about that long, and they had curls inside of them. It looked a greenish black color, and it looked like they was, I don't know if it come from the pure char being burnt. I don't know what that was. I don't know if that's their natural being state, but whenever they were there, you could tell it had effect on them, but their flesh was not running down like later I seen of the other ones. Because after I had this vision, then God showed me some more visions of this place two more times after that. And so uh, I really, honest and truthful, you got your senses. Because in the spirit, when Jesus come back, you can remember, he told them, give me something to eat. And he was in his spiritual body then. And we understand even angels, they prepare food. You know what I'm saying? They ate with Abraham. And so we understand that angels, angelic beings, they eat. But here's the only thing, though. You got a seal from a king that's in a lock, says you can't go no further after I put you here. Even inside of the time when the, the man was sitting there, even when the legions, he's like, have you come to torment us before our time? We can, we know we got a time. The Satan knows he's got an X amount of time. And that's why he is running around doing everything he possibly can. You see, a lot of times we've been taught that we want to leave it before it gets bad. But what if we have to stay until it gets better? That's good. That's good. So so what did you hear, though? And was there an odor? Profanity. You hear profanity. You hear like a growling sounds and you hear profanity. There is more profanity. Just like we want to praise God, you can imagine that they're cursing him. And when they see anything, when they looked at me, their desire, 100%, if I had to say, on a court, standing before a judge, they wanted to destroy me. The only reason they did, the first one did not do it, the chain stopped, and when he went like that. So he is limited to a certain point. When I done that, I backed just as far as, it was like I'm trying to back up into something, and it's almost like inside of water that you're trying to move, but there's nothing that you can move from. It's like, you are here, and you can't communicate with nobody. And because you're here, it's almost like lunch for them. We'll devour you. We'll eat you. 
And it's a place the Bible says the worm never dies. It's a place where the maggots is at. They're eating upon your flesh when you're falling there. I thank God that they weren't none inside of me. You know what I'm saying? I thank God that these things weren't there on me that day. And uh, I'm a born-again Christian, believed in God 100%, but I'll tell you what, when I come out of it today, uh, every day I evaluate my life, and here's what I tell people, hey, I repent every day, not just Sunday. Every day is a good day to repent because I don't want my, I don't want nobody that, the people that, if I dislike anybody, I don't want them to go there. The Bible says, pray for your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully, bless them that despitefully use you. And guess what? I don't want nobody to go. There was an odor, and I, I don't understand the odor. It's a ranky smell. Now, as dealing with deliverance and different things, you know a smell of cinch. You know it. Some people says the way, um, like sulfur smell, it's got a different smell. But honest and truthful, one of our friends, he actually was a DOA. And um, he said he heard them calling out. He actually passed away. And he started talking with me and he started telling me some things. And I'm like, this happened. He's like, I seen part of this. I seen part of this. And uh, God sometimes gets our attention. I cannot give you a hundred percent saying that my nose was so key. I was in such so much fright until there is a smell, but later in life you learn what those smells are from that place. But the closest thing that you can ever that I can say to it is we cook on the grill sometimes. And if you get the thing really hot when you sear your meat, the back of your hand, the hairs burn. And it's got an odor. That odor don't compare to it. It's a rottenness stench. But it's hard to describe something almost, yeah, let's see, how can I say this? It is, it is a smell that you don't want to smell, but yet it is not a fragrance that you smell on this earth. It's almost like, your breath's being taken away from you, but it is a rotten type of odor. Scott, you mentioned yes, that you had two other instances of when you saw hell as well. Is there a way you can give us a quick summary of those events? Yes, ma'am. Um, so later on, as I was sitting there, the Lord showed me this place. And um, I had open vision. When I say open vision, sometimes I'll be sitting there looking at you and it's just like everything goes away. When everything went away, I'm sitting here and the Lord picks my body up and brings me up over a, a hill. And it's beautiful grass. Everything's green. It's got green grass. And there's people that's backed up on top of each other. And here's what I hear him say. Watch. And so when I started coming down, going to the corner of the hill, going to people's top of their heads, and I'm going to this place, I start seeing liquid fire coming out. And this fire is going up and down, up and down. And it was almost like a volcano in front of the people. And he takes me to the front of the people and turns me around. And I'm looking right at them. When the people gets to the very corner of the cliff, before they fall in this big mass, big old pit, here's what they're doing. They're trying to stop, but the people behind them are shoving them off. And he took me down and brought me straight like a zoom in on a lens. It went from, say, like a 30 millimeter to like a 700. It brought me right in, zoomed it up. And I seen the cliff. He says, look at the rocks. And you can see where people's feet has been carved in it, where they got pushed off. He says, Scott, it's too late when they reach this point. And here's what he told me. He says, unless you tell the people about me, about this place, the blood's going to be on your hands. And he took me to Ezekiel 33. The watchman must speak the word. I remember coming out of that and I'm like, Lord, and what do you do? You have to share the gospel with people. So when people says, why do you share the gospel? Is it for money? No, ain't got nothing to do with that. Now you know why later I never thought that we didn't even have a network, but God gave it to us. And you know how we take care of that. We live by faith. You know what I'm saying? Because when everything's said and done, there's people out there that needs an opportunity just to be able to be heard. And then the next time I was sitting there cutting grass and behind mom and daddy's house on daddy's lawnmower, I was cutting grass, woke up cadet, taking my time, and everything goes right away. And I start seeing this man. And he's sitting there and he's, 
he's using profanity that I didn't even want to hear, honest and truthful. And he's hollering out so loud and he's screaming. And his flesh looks like it's falling off. It looks like a candle wax just being dropping little drops. Or if you take plastic and melt plastic, you hear it say, zoop, zoop. You can see it falling. His flesh is falling off of him. But when his flesh is falling off, you can see the skeletons inside of him. Now, inside the skeleton, it looks like worms that's inside of their flesh. This man is clothed with no, he has no clothes on. He's completely naked. Now, you can imagine being embarrassed because you have no clothes to cover you. But now the flames is covering up, so I couldn't tell. But by his facial structure, you can tell a structure of a male or a female. You can tell it. And the man's structure was of a male, but he had flames coming all off of him. But now inside of his being, that's when you know the Bible says there's a worm. And the worm is feeding upon their flesh. And so I see this, and I'm saying, oh, my goodness. And so now it's time to got to go preach the gospel. And so we went to a church one time and there you share this right here. And sometimes if you've been taught in different denominations, they're like, I, I don't know about this. And so I said, Lord, I don't want to tell people about it. Lord, I'd I'll just preach your gospel. Luke chapter 16 is good enough for me. I can preach it good because I can tell you I, I've been there. You know what I'm saying? I know what this man sees. And sometimes you just, people won't receive God's word either. When you were down there the first time, not the second and third time, but the first time, did you feel the presence of God with you? No, ma'am. That's what made it so terrifying. But when I called on the name of Jesus, I got out of that place because I've learned my life, even through different situations, call on Jesus. When anything, it don't matter if something bad, something good, Jesus, Jesus, Lord Jesus, because whoever calls him Lord Jesus shall be saved. And I thank him for calling out his name when I was there because I'm going to tell you the truth. It wasn't but a few moments, but it was enough to shake me the rest of my life. And then from those experiences, um, there was a gentleman who used to build houses, and um, he was an older gentleman. Mr. Terry went to the hospital, and he had a heart attack, and he couldn't sleep for three or four days. And um, he told a doctor he had to give him something to knock him out. He says, I am so terrified. And this man went from being fearless to fearful. And he was trying to, he was fighting everything. He said, I, I can't live like this. <clears throat> and um, he called me and my wife to go over there. He said, Scott, I need Scott. Get up with Scott and tell Scott to come here. Mr. Terry's worked for us. He's done family work, different things with houses. Awesome, awesome guy. And uh, when I walked in, have you ever seen a man that has been terrified? You can just tell it in his eyes, the way he's looking. I look at him, I said, Mr. Terry, are you okay? He says, Scott, you know what happened to me? I said, yes, sir. He said, I have seen some things, and I don't know what to tell you. I said, did you see things with scales about this big? Did you see things that reached out, tried to tear you up? And he looks at me and his eyes, he says, you know about me. I said, yes, sir. I said, God showed that to me. He said, Scott, and Mr. Terry got his life right with Jesus. And grown man could not sleep for days because he didn't want to close his eyes and face anything that he could have to see this again. And so are they there to terrify you? Yes. And here's what's really sad, Miss Jennifer. <clears throat> There's people living today that's demon-possessed. They got demons inside of them. And how can a how can a Christian have a demon? You got the holy of holies, you got the outer courts, inner courts. Think about it. Lord run the people out of the outer courts. They was out there in the courtyard. Sometimes we don't give God every bit of our life. And so we have other things that comes in. They live there, they dwell there. And um the same things that's going to be in hell is living in people today. They need deliverance, they need help. And what's so good is repentance. You get right with Jesus, I'm going to tell you the truth. We don't ever want to leave nobody behind. We want to make sure everybody gets set free, delivered, and make sure that they know about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, now, when you said that when you were in hell, what got you out was when you called the name of Jesus. 
Um, yes, there ma may be some people believing right now that, okay, fine. If I go to hell, <clears throat> all I have to do is call the name of Jesus. Why doesn't that work? <laughs> After death comes judgment. It doesn't come second chance. Grace don't come after death. And here's the problem. Here's the thing. I weren't dead. What I was going in is sitting here. I was the one that was a born again Christian. Thought everything was super. And God took me to a place in a vision. That's a difference of vision. And that vision, I thank God it didn't leave scars on my face. You know what I'm saying? Because when I seen that stuff on my face, I knew this is, this is real. And I didn't realize that he was equipped in me to help his people later. I didn't realize sometimes we go through things and we are terrified. And we're saying, God, I don't want people to know about my scars. I don't want people. And here's what I learned about the master. He shows you his scars. His, shots, his scars shows you his grace, his mercy. When you see an individual that's got scars on their life, you can sit back and say, that's the hand of my God that saved me. There isn't a sin that is so deep that God can't save you. Amen. So when you came out, did you question your salvation? Because, you know, you were down there, you were in an open vision and you experienced what it was like to be in hell for a certain amount of time. Did you question your salvation? Did you feel like, oh my gosh, am I saved? Why was I down there? Why was I almost being attacked? What was your mindset? Yes, ma'am. I, I, hey, I went to repent mode. You know what I'm saying? I repent a hundred percent because God, you tell me my secret sins because God knows my heart. And I've learned things in my life since that time. Um, I thank God I didn't die back then because there's things that I could repent now for that I'm still learning because a seed is small, but with time it grows. And if you leave a little bit of bitterness for a little bit of while, it'll grow into a big tree before long. You've got a whole bunch of bondages. And so am I perfect? No, ma'am. Have I ever been perfect? No, ma'am. Have I been full of sin? Yes, ma'am. Have I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? I have, and the Bible teaches me to repent daily, not just now and then. So I live a repentant lifestyle, and um, I want to see my King. And here's what I try to live by my very best, is to understand that I serve now, and when this life is over, I just continue serving. That's what it's about, just serving. So Scott, you mentioned that when you came out, you went to look in the mirror and you had water blisters on your head. Did you think it was from the heat at first? Because you said it reminded you of leprosy. I didn't know at the time anything about leprosy. That was many years later that God, because I didn't want to share it because I don't want to get behind a pulpit or behind a camera or anything else and share something with people that doesn't line up with God's word. And the only part that I couldn't figure out was why did I have these things on my forehead? And it, I know where it came from. I, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what you saw was what I heard. What you saw was real. Okay, I can't deny this, Lord. But when it says, take your finger and wipe across it, when I took my hand and just wiped across it, they went away. It went away so fast until I'm like, I went in denial 100% saying, you're, you're, you're in a state of being then thinking, what has just taken place? Because sometimes we're not programmed to walk around like, I know it. No, when it happens to you, you're like, oh my goodness. Because I went out of practically shock because when I just step, you can imagine stepping into hell and then stepping out and you're like, this ain't real. This ain't real. I don't believe it. And something says, go look in the mirror. And I walked in front of the mirror when you see it and you see these blisters on your head and you're like, oh my goodness. And then it says, take your finger. I thank God for grace, how he allows us to wash away it. And when it went away and then you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit audible, what you've seen is real. Okay. Does it really matter if people believe you at that time? Nope. Do I know there's a hell? Yes. What does that teach me? Repent fast. I tell people all the time, if you sin, repent fast. If you're out there living a sinful lifestyle, repent fast. But remember one thing, when the snake bites you, you might walk away, but the venom's still inside of you. After you give your life to Jesus, make sure you cleanse up the bloodline also. Make sure because God takes care of your sins, but those iniquities of the fathers, those curses that comes on, got to cancel those things out because can't take covenant with them. Um, I really like how you said that 
if you get a snake bite and you walk away, you still have that venom and you need to get rid of that bloodline. And that's really important because a lot of people believe that when they give their life to Jesus, everything is just clean slates with their life. You know, all the curses are broken. That's in generational lines or what you've done. But you say that's actually sometimes not the case. Jesus Christ forgives all your sins. Your sins is forgiven. To be born again is to go into the kingdom. He is the door. You open into the kingdom. You got access to the king. You are a citizen. But when you walk in, you got to cleanse, make sure there is family lineages. There's things that you're going to have to still deal with. What do I mean? Unforgiveness. How can you have it? You can be, you can love the Lord and give your life to him and serve God and shout inside the church and run around. Thank you, Jesus. But hate your brother. You can have bitterness that's still left there that you thought you dealt with, but the roots was still deeper than just at your carnal being. And so God starts dealing with you because here's what we, we serve a merciful God. We serve a gracious God. We serve a God that is willing to give us time that we will be more like him because the Bible says when we see him, we'll be like him. The problem is we're not like him yet. And so what he's doing is it starts working with us. and. Just like family curses and everything else. You says everything's washed away, but why am I still being in bondage? Why do I still have these problems? Have you dealt with the curses from the past? They're like, no, I don't know about curses. <clears throat> the Bible says Jesus shed his blood. He was bruised for our iniquity. The iniquity. What is the iniquity? The iniquity of the fathers. So now you're sitting there looking at generations. Why do you do things that your granddaddy done? Hmm. Probably because of the iniquities of the Father. Now you got to sit there and you got to break those off. And that's called deliverance. And so salvation gets you in the kingdom. Deliverance lets you to walk freedom. That's the children's bread. So what do you do? After you become a citizen of the kingdom, you eat his bread. You get deliverance. You've been set free. Who the son sets free is free indeed. So you can walk into the kingdom, but yet guess what? You can be like Mephibosheth. You can be still crippled. And so in the Bible, so you might be sitting there, I got a blessings of the kingdom, but I'm still crippled. That's why you eat at the table and you understand, okay, that there's healing because the woman said, you do call me a dog. And that's the truth. I am uncovenant. But she tapped in by faith saying, even the dogs eat from the master's table. If the mass, if the crumb was sufficient to heal her daughter, what will the loaf do for me and you? So I want to talk about how there was a man on his deathbed and you began to pray, but you said the Lord stopped you and said, stop praying, Scott. What happened in that story? Um, the gentleman was, he got in a wreck and mama told me, she says, Scott, so-and-so got in a wreck and um, we need to pray for him. It's, it's serious. So I went, laid across the bed and, um, when I looked through the bed, I seen the base plugs. And I always think about, mom always told me, there's a source that we can plug into it. And that's the Holy Spirit. And I started praying. And I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit tell me so clearly, stop praying. And this has happened prior before in different seasons of my life. And this time he showed me why. And I was like, why do I need to quit praying? Is he okay? What? And at that moment, the base plug that I was looking at just like went away. And when it went away, I seen this man with his flesh dripping with flames and him falling. And I knew at that moment he was in hell. And I walked in there and mama's like, Scott, what happened to you, babe? I says, wink, 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 got to pray for him. Mom. And I told her what took place. And I said, he's in hell. And a few minutes later, the telephone rings, and they tell us they're crying on the telephone saying that so-and-so passed away. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know where he's at. And then I beat myself up many times, and here's what I say. Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I do this more? Why don't I tell people more about Jesus? And what really hurts, honest and truthful, I was talking with one of our friends um, the other day, T.C., and um, he works with the enforcement officers. Why won't people listen? Why don't people take the heat? And it goes back to 16 and Luke. They got the prophets. They got them. But yet they think they they think that they can get there another way. 
Um, there was a gentleman one time they they come here to speak at a church for us, and they said this must be at the end of the earth. I said no, it's the beginning, and <laughs> that's where it starts at. And they didn't they like we they told us to go here, and we told them which way to go. And um, they seen the sign that we had, and that one was she was so thankful. She's like, I was asking God for a sign, and I seen the big sign, and we just put it up the same day. What do I mean by that? We told them how to get to our place of worship, the house that day. Sometimes they try to get it their way instead of the way that it's been told. If I tell you how to get to a certain destination, I tell you, I, this is where I stay at. And I'm telling you how to get there. And you say, I think I can go another direction and get there. And then you call me and say, Scott, I'm lost. It's not really surprising, is it? When our Father has given us the Word, and we tell Him we know another way how to get to Him, we shouldn't be shocked when we stand before Him one day and hear Him say, depart from me. Because when we tell the Creator we know more of the creation, we know more. We're the creation. We know more. I pray that people repent today and receive Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, it will be your home. Speaking of salvation, the Lord didn't leave you hanging. He remembered your prayer from when <clears throat> you were eight years old about seeing heaven. And you were actually able to have an open vision of heaven. Finally, tell us about that because hell is so depressing. Heaven is so joyous. <clears throat> tell us about your experience Amen. of seeing heaven. Well, the good thing about heaven is, is to know that <clears throat> that is where God's at. And so um, we was getting ready to shoot the first little small video about hell. And I was sitting there and I was complaining a little bit. And I know God was hearing what I was saying. I was like, I've wanted to see heaven all my life. And Lord, I get to talk about hell. And um, I'm like, Lord, I'd, I'd like to preach about heaven. Heaven's a wonderful place now. You know what I'm saying? I, I like heaven. And uh, I was in there talking. And so I just went to the office and um, outside of our office at the home place is um, Four Bay Garage on the other side. So I was walking up to the office. I was sitting there talking, and it had green color walls, um, high ceilings. And I was sitting there. All of a sudden, everything went white, and it just it went away. It stepped like into another portal. And when I looked in that place, I knew at that moment my eyes has just seen what I have prayed for since I was eight years old. And Miss Jennifer, there is a city when I looked on the right that is more beautiful than anything that these eyes has ever seen in this earth. And when I looked at it, there was lights that was coming out of that city that had some of the most beautiful colors, diamonds that sparkled. When I went to get Amanda's ring, I remember sitting there looking at studying at grades and everything else. And I seen stuff reflect in light that the clarity of it, it is amazing. In our life that we've studied um, rifle scopes, different things, optics, to see clarity when we hunt and do different things. And I'm seeing clarity that is beautiful. So Warski ain't got nothing on this. And I'm sitting over there looking, saying, God. And I see this woman come running. And I'm still looking beyond her because I'm looking at this city with these colors. They are purples. There's like pinks. They are orange. It's like a blue color, and these colors is, it's illuminate. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing, God. Because for the last couple of weeks, I've been studying nothing but lights. I studied fluorescent. I studied um, incandescent. I studied all kinds of lights about how to get shadows not on people when you when you record. And because the next day was when I was going to be recording. Now, Mr. Lake was coming in. Mr. Lake passed away, Superman of God him and his family, Miss Judy. And so um, they were coming in and I was sitting there and I'm just looking and this lady comes running up and I don't know who she is. I'm like, okay, shortcut kind of hair. And she's got, it looks like a lace type material. It looks beautiful. It looks elegant. If I could say a queen would wear what she had on. It looked very elegant. And it was like a dress type style. And she come running up and she was so happy. And she said, tell Paul, hey. And she waved in her hand like that. And I'm sitting there thinking, who is this? And in my mind, I says, this, I knew a lady named Maddie. And um, 
But I knew her in her older years. I didn't know her in her younger years. I knew her in her late, um, they kept getting a lot older, you know what I'm saying? And so she was an older, elderly woman that had a lot of problems health-wise, walking and different things. But she was always friendly, always friendly. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And she says, she looked, and this man comes, like, jumping and jaw. It's like he's, he's, it's almost like he's floating. But he's a running lad. And he says, Maddie. When he said Maddie, I'm like, this is Maddie. And she looks over there and she says, Roscoe. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what has taken place? And my eyes is still looking around and I'm seeing this woman and her face. And here's what something says. There's no shadow. And I'm like, there's no shadow here. And I look down at the grass. There is no brown. There is green upon green upon green upon there is life in this city, just as much as hell has got everything totally against the word. It, it goes against everything that, of God. It goes opposite. This scale over here goes where life is. There is life. There is flamboyancy, I promise you. There, it, it's amazing. This city that I've seen upon this hill sitting over there, eyes hasn't seen, ears hasn't. Mm -mm. But then God dealt with me and says, God, but, it's, but the Spirit has revealed this to you. I'm like, okay, Lord. But then she turns around and she looks at me and he's telling her to come on, come on. And I'm like, have you ever just enjoyed something wonderful like in your mouth, something sweet? It's like a little, they bring you a little big plate, a little plate with a little thing on it and you just put it in it and it's got so many flavors. And I'm sitting here and enjoying every moment of this. This is like, this is heaven on earth. God, this is what you prayed for, baby. And I was so happy. I'm like, Lord. And she's telling me something. I'm tuned in. I'm listening now. I'm like, listen, I'm sitting there. And she's, he's like, come on, let's go. And she says, tell Isaline I'm waiting for her. Well, Isaline's my grandma. And grandma was getting a little bit in her. She had a lot of problems that she was going through. And so uh, we've been praying for grandma to get better, to be healed. But I'm sitting over there thinking, okay, well, Roscoe pulls her and she runs off with her feet kicking left to right, acts like a little, acts like my young, acts like a little girl just cutting up. There ain't no crying. There is happiness. There, this, this place here is amazing. And then it goes away and I'm like, God, I want to see more of this. So I kept praying and I would always pray. And the enemy says, you know, you're going to have to die to see it. I said, God, please don't let me die right now. I, I, want, I want to tell people about this place. And um, so he showed me different things later with different people and certain things. And it's, it's interesting at the least what God done. But now my grandma, a few days later, she goes home to be with the Lord. And my uncle pulls up at the home place and he pulls up there and he talks to me. He calls me Skeeter. He said, hey, Skeeter, how you doing? I said, doing pretty good. And so I talked with my uncle. And I says, you might think I'm crazy, but I had something that happened the other night. And I told him about what was going on because He's like everybody else. We love the Lord, but we're just human beings. That's what we are. We're human. We're made in flesh. Our very best is as filthy rags, but you know what? God loves us. and He cleansed us up. And I thank God that one day we can lay down everything at his feet. And so um, I start telling my uncle about it. He says, um, when I told him that Maddie said, tell Islin I'm waiting for her. He said, he just stopped. It was outside of the house, beside his vehicle. He said, Skeeter, what'd you say? And his voice changed from being friendly to, what did you just say? And it got deeper. I'm like, oh, Lord, he thinks I'm crazy probably. I said, you might think I'm crazy. He said, no, 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 Skeeter. I, I want to hear this. Tell me you're not crazy. He said, I'm getting to share something with you. He said, I was with Mama when Mama passed. And so I shared him what I, what I saw and what I heard Maddie say. Tell Isaline I'm waiting for her. He said, before she passed, her last words was, I see Maddie. I see Maddie. And when I heard that, I'm like, God, what I saw was real. And God, there is, when you, the spiritual world is more realer than what we're in right now. Just because our eyes ain't being opened, there's angels beside me right now. There's angels beside you. They're guardians. God in, protects his investments. He died for us. Don't tell me he wouldn't put people around us, beings to protect us, to guard us, 
to speak to us. They're ministering spirits. What does that mean? They're speaking into us at times. When Jesus was sitting there in the garden praying, they ministered to him. And I thank God today. But that, that was one of the ones of that, and that was the first one that I seen. But man, it's amazing when those open visions come up because sometimes they happen in the most strangest places. I was on a tractor and one time, and when it opened up, I seen things and heard things that I just wondered about for many years. And when I wondered about that, that's why we're doing what we're doing today to share the gospel, letting people know about a prophetic voice, about their words, about dreams and visions, because people need to understand what they're going through is real. And God's using that to speak to them when they're sleeping, when they're slumbering on the bed, when he opens up those visions and he's speaking your destiny for you. Amen. And speaking about sharing your testimony, you have a network called Cumbies Network and your YouTube channel where you even elaborate even more. Could you share with us your network as well as your Facebook page and any way people can contact you if they'd like to? Sure. Um, we thank you so much, Miss Jennifer. We are so blessed to have you on the network. You, you, your channel is amazing, honest and truthful, especially all your wonderful listeners. We, we love each and every one of you, you and your family. And um, the Lord blessed us with Cumbies Network. I didn't even know what Cumbies meant. I thought it was a name, but God's got a greater purpose. Cumbies mean many seeds that will be. And just like he spoke light be, he spoke things out of darkness into light. And um, he's blessed us with a network. And um, we're bringing people on to proclaim Jesus Christ to a lost and dying generation. And that's what it's all about. Um, we got a YouTube channel. We starting off. I think we only got like 11 videos right now, but we're starting over there on that. And I didn't think a lot of times things was very important until I realized that people is involved in this because sometimes we look at networks, but we don't realize that there's people behind these networks. There's people that's going to hell. There's people going to heaven. And I want to deplete hell and I want to fill up heaven because my savior died for me. He died for you. And, um, <clears throat> You can go get up with us anyway through social media. Miss Jennifer's always wonderful. You're a wonderful host. And um, just look down at the bottom. If you want to go to TV at Cumbies, that's how you can get up with us with our email, tv at cumbies.com. And, or you can go to cumbies.com. And um, we would love to have you listen to your testimonies and just celebrate Jesus Christ because God has done so much for me. And I know he's done so much for you. Amen. And we're going to have all that at the bottom in the description for those of you who would like to learn more and contact Scott Cumby. Now, Scott, could you do us a favor, our usual? Sure. Could you please pray for those who would like to make sure that they are saved and those who would like to get saved to do so and to soften the hearts who may be on the fence? Yes, ma'am. Dear Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we know you've heard your children's cries. You've heard your the parents, Lord. You've heard the grandparents. And God, what is so wonderful is to know, Lord, that you died for each and every one of us. And God, I ask you right now, Lord, as I'm looking into that lens, God, that I know people's looking at me. And Lord, I just want them to know that you died for them. Lord, that you died for them in their sin. And God, that you can eradicate it, that you can wash it away. And the only thing they got to do today is to repent. And Lord, we ask you right now, Father, to Lord, to soften the hearts of the hardened ones. God, that you will go inside there, Lord, and you reach down wherever they may be at tonight, today, no matter where they are, God, that you will go there, Lord, and Lord, that you'll start drawing Holy Spirit, draw them to you, to the word of God. Lord, that you will use this as a tool, an instrument, God, and God, that I can give encouragement to the ones that's been praying for their family members, for their lost loved ones, for the ones that's down there at different places. Lord, this week I've heard of testimonies where men are crying out for their brothers not to go to a devil's hell. That they're waiting to hear this wonderful good news that I received Jesus. And I want to share with you today, the Bible says, if you'll believe it in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and that God raised him on the third day that you can be born again. So I ask you, if you're willing to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
If you're willing to escape the flames of hell and to walk into glory, the only way that you can stay there is by Jesus Christ. And I would ask you right now to pray along with us. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me, Father. God, I repent before you. And I ask you to come into my life. Lord, I confess that you died for my sins. And God, that you raised him on that third and glorious day. And Lord, by your words, I am saved. I want to welcome you into the family of God, but now I want to pray for the ones that's sitting there that feels like they've backslidden a little way further. What is so good about God is he tells you to be hot or be cold, but don't be lukewarm. And what is so good is to know that he's got extended hands to you right now. Just because you walked away, that same choice that made you walk away is a choice today you have to walk back to him. Walk into his arms and ask him to forgive you and he'll wrap around his loving arms. He will call you his child and he will hold you dear. And I ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, to give you thoughts, ideals, and concepts to bless you and your family. God, we ask you, Lord, to give them dreams and visions, God, that you can speak to them, Father. And God, that they can understand that your word is so true. So today, as you've done that, I want to challenge you to spend time in God's word. Read God's word. Find a good Bible-based church. Get involved in it and start letting the world know about Jesus. If there's anything that you don't know, look on your, your phones, look on the internet, find a good preacher, find some mentors, find some elderly people that's sitting there that knows the word and have let them a mentor you. Let them speak to you. Contact us. We would love to hear from you. We would love to impart back in your life resources that can change your life for eternity. And we thank you so much. And we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Scott Cumby with the Cumbies Network. Thanks so much for joining us again. Um, I know for a fact that people will be hooked to this, um, that it will not only convict them, but it will convict them to Jesus, even those who are born again, just to, you know, give them a freshen up, you know. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. To God be all the glory. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.